This video is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com to start your free trial today. The Mongols had defeated the Khwarezmian Empire during the campaign of 1219 to 1221. But there was more to gain to the east, and the expedition of Jebe and Subutai across Iran and the Caucasus proved just that. The Mongol Empire was slowly changing, but their desire for lands and riches was still strong. The Seljuks and Mamluks were standing in their way, and they fought against Mongol expansion until it reached its peak at the decisive Battle of Ain Jalut. After his defeat at the Battle of the Indus River in the spring of 1221, the prince of the Khwarezmian Empire Jalal al-Din continued retreating deeper into Punjab. Soon, the Mongol troops stopped chasing him. Jalal al-Din spent the next three years gathering his forces in the area and even took over most of Punjab. He attempted to get the Mamluk Sultan of Delhi to ally against the Mongols, but the latter wasn't eager to draw the ire of Genghis. Instead, in 1224, the Sultan attacked Jalal al-Din. The prince was forced to leave Lahore. He raided Gujarat and then returned to Iran in the same year. As his father was long dead, Jalal al-Din claimed the throne of Khwarezm. Iran and the Caucasus had been weakened by Jebe and Subutai a few years before, so he had an easy time consolidating the region. He destroyed the state of the Atabegs of Azerbaijan and moved his capital to Tabriz, away from Mongol reach. In the same year, he vassalized the Shirvan Shahs and attacked Georgia. In 1226, the Georgians were defeated at the Battle of Ghani. Tbilisi was captured after that, and both the Christian and Muslim population of the city were massacred. The Mongols sent a small army to Iran in 1227, but Jalal al-Din crushed it near Ray. His activity in the area provoked a response. The Sultan of the Seljuks of Rum, Kaykabad I, Ayyubid Sultan al-Kamil, and the King of Cilician Armenia, Hethum I, united their forces against him in 1228, and the Khwarezmian forces were soundly defeated near Erevan. This war weakened him, and all over Iran and the Caucasus, rebellions against him began. The great Khan Ogadeh used this and sent an army under Chormakan to conquer Iran once again. The Mongols won a battle against the Shah somewhere in central Iran in 1231. Jalal al-Din retreated all the way to modern Turkey, with the Mongols chasing. Finally, Jalal al-Din was assassinated in Silvan, and the Khwarezmian Empire ceased to exist. The Seljuks, Cilicia and Georgia became the vassals of the Great Khan. Little of note happened in the region in the next decade, as the Mongols were busy with the campaign in Eastern Europe. But when Ogadeh passed away in 1241, the Mongol governor of the region, Baiju, asked the Seljuk Sultan Caicosraw II to renew his vassal oath. The latter refused and raided another Mongol vassal, Georgia. Baiju pushed the Seljuks back and moved towards Erzurum. The envoys sent to the city were not killed, but insulted. Still, Erzurum was taken and its population was massacred. The Mongols then retreated to amass more troops in Georgia and Armenia. Sultan Caicosraw II asked his allies to help and received minor assistance from Nicaea, Trebizond, the Ayyubids, and even recruited some mercenaries from among the Crusaders. The 30,000 strong Mongol army moved into Seljuk territory in 1243, and Kirkusra's 60,000 met them in June at Kursida near modern day Sivas. We know very little about the ensuing battle. But the Mongols feigned retreat yet again and forced the Seljuk vanguard, which had around 20,000 troops, to chase them. As soon as a significant gap formed between the vanguard and the rest of the Sultan's forces, the Mongols turned back 
surrounded and crushed the Seljuks. The Sultan and his advisors retreated, and the Seljuks were forced to become Mongol vassals yet again. In Mongolia, Mongkur became the Great Khan in 1251 and gave his brothers Kublai and Hulagu supervisory roles in China and Persia respectively. In 1256, Hulagu entered the Middle East with more than 100,000 warriors. He conquered the remnants of the Khwarezmian Empire and then moved against the legendary Hashashin Order. These renowned and feared assassins held dozens of fortresses, but a combination of infighting and the fact that by now the Mongols were experts at siege warfare inflicted heavy casualties upon them. Their Grand Master surrendered and handed all the fortresses to Hulagu. With all of Iran secured, Hulagu sent word to the Abbasid Caliph al Mustasim demanding his obedience, but the latter refused. On January 11, 1258, the Mongols approached Baghdad, the biggest and most prosperous city of its time. Al-Mustasim finally decided to meet them in battle and sent out a force of 20,000 cavalry to attack the Mongols. These troops defeated the Mongol vanguard, but rather than retreat to the safety of the city walls, they set up camp and enjoyed a feast of celebration. The next morning, they were surrounded by the Mongols on one side and by the river on the other. Those who were not killed in the slaughter drowned. The Mongols built walls around the city to provide safety for the siege engines, as well as to prevent the defenders from breaking out. al Mustasim made attempts to negotiate peace, but that ship had already sailed. By February 10th, 1258, the city surrendered under a constant barrage of catapult fire. The sacking continued for seven days, and only the Christian population of the city was spared. The Grand Library of Baghdad was burned to the ground. This destruction put an end to the Islamic Golden Age, and moved the center of power from Baghdad to Cairo. For the first time in Muslim history, Islam had no caliph. Hulagu didn't intend to stop as he pushed forward towards Syria. Aside from the coastal territory belonging to the Crusader states, most of the Levant was still under the control of the Ayyubid Sultanate, which was weakened by the loss of Egypt to the Mamluks. The Ayyubids offered to pay tribute, but Hulagu was not interested. He was joined by the Georgians, Armenians, and the troops of the Crusader Prince, Bohemond VII, and on January 18, 1260, Aleppo was besieged and suffered the same fate as Baghdad. This caused massive panic and resulted in the cities of Homs and Damascus willingly surrendering, sparing themselves from destruction. But suddenly, grave news was delivered to Hulagu. The great Khan Mongkur died of sickness during the war against the Song dynasty in China. This sent a ripple through the empire and halted the massive campaigns. The empire was on the brink of civil war, and Hulagu left the Levant for Mongolia. One or two Tumen stayed in the region under the command of Kidbuka. The Mamluks were offered peace, but they knew that Hulagu left with the majority of his troops, so the Mongol envoys were killed. Kitbuka tried to form an alliance with the Crusader states, however that attempt failed. Mamluk Sultan Kutuz assembled his army and moved to Palestine. When news of this reached Kitbuka, he prepared to meet the Mamluk's army, but a rebellion in Damascus slowed him down. Meanwhile, the Mamluks moved north and camped outside of Acre. Mongol spies reported back to Kitbuka that the enemy army outnumbered his at least two to one. Still, the Mongol general left Damascus with an army of some 25,000 men, made up of Mongols, Georgians and Armenians. In early September 1260, he crossed the Jordan River and entered the valley near the village of Angelut, where, according to legend, David slew Goliath.
the Mongol cavalry charged the Mamluk vanguard commanded by Baybars. This group broke under the charge and fled up the valley. Kitbuka gave chase, but in reality, the Mongols were falling for their own trick, as Baybars was luring his enemies in with this retreat. The Mongols pursued the broken vanguard to the valley, where Kutuz awaited with most of his forces. Baybars' troops finally reached the main line. Despite having vastly superior numbers, the Sultan was cautious and stayed in position. Kitbuka used that and decided to commit all of his troops. The Mongols were to engage the entire Mamluk army. The Mongol second line was ordered to wheel right and run the Mamluk front ranks towards Kutuz's left wing. The entire left flank of the Muslim army started crumbling under the Mongol pressure. The Sultan tried to regain his left side for hours. His troops from the right flank were sent to the left, and eventually the Mongols were pushed back and the left side was restored. Kutuz sent his reserves to the extreme wings. It was the moment for the final attack, and Kutuz personally led his bodyguards into battle. The Mongol army fought well, but they were pinned in place by the overwhelming numbers of their foe. When all the Mongol troops were engaged, Kutuz sent his extreme flanks into the attack. The Mongols were close to being surrounded, and when their leader died in the center, they started to flee. They lost between five and 10,000 warriors. The Mamluks won at Anjalut using their superior numbers and by mirroring the usual Mongol tactics. Anjalut also made the Mamluks into the most significant Muslim power of its time. Internal conflicts over the succession delayed the Mongol response, and while they didn't know it yet, this would be their zenith and the beginning of the end of the greatest empire the world had ever seen. When we create our videos, we often use the series of lectures called The Decisive Battles of World History from Professor Gregory Aldretti, provided by the sponsor of this video, The Great Courses Plus. This 36-part series covers the crucial battles of history across all periods, starting with the Battle of Kadesh in the Bronze Age to Stalingrad during World War II. You can subscribe to The Great Courses Plus to get access to the vast library of 9,000 lectures on history, science, literature, and other subjects from the top-notch professors from the best universities in the world. The Great Courses Plus is giving viewers a great offer of a free trial. Show your support to our channel and learn more about the Step Peoples by subscribing to The Great Courses Plus through thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash kings and generals or the short link in the description. Thank you for watching the fifth video in our series on the Mongol invasions. The next episode will conclude the first season of this series and will be dedicated to the conquest of China and the campaigns against Japan. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us directly via YouTube by pressing the sponsorship button directly below the video. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.